I think everybody gets excited about big bluegills. I'm talking about big bulls, you know, nine, 10 inch fish or even bigger. You know, and I tell you what, 30 years ago, that type of fish was a lot easier to find. And obviously, you know, just you know, the technology, the number of anglers, you know, catching big bluegills has gotten harder and harder on a lot of lakes. And so Minnesota's been doing some pretty interesting uh, lake management type stuff with the Bluegill Initiative, where basically they're managing some lakes to produce trophy class panfish. So on today's episode, we're gonna do a deep dive in some of this new bluegill management strategy and how it can affect your fishing. That is a big bull bluegill. Wow, gorgeous pike right there. Here they showed up. Oh, oh there he is. Oh, look at these fish. They are rushing up. There he is, there he is. Cannibalistic jumbos, unbelievable. The whole, the big one. That is what we're talking about tonight, a cool looking fish. Now you're dialed in. Oh, that's fun. It's like a phone fish, you know what? Right back down to the bottom. It's one of the powerful freshwater fish that swims. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. That's a nice walleye. Jason Mitchell Outdoors is brought to you by Clam, Shields, Vexilar, Ice Armor by Clam, K-Drill, Clam Pro Tackle, Ice Defense, Bismarck Motor Company, Crestliner, North Dakota Tourism, and Jason Mitchell Elite Series Fishing Rods. Just kind of drilling the trap line, drilling holes on the edge of the basin where that soft bottom comes up to the break. And basically these fish are moving up and down through this. And you know, you can either sit in one spot, let the fish move to you, or you can drill your holes and move a little bit to try to contact fish. But uh, yeah, just drilling holes and getting set up. Got a little perch coming in off the bottom, but oh, there's a bigger mark up higher. Oh, there he is. Hey, that's a good one. Get that transducer out of the hole. Oh, look at that. That is a plate. Look at that. Look at the big ears on just the gorgeous colors. Something got a hold of her. Go hold of him. Get this hook out and I guess any fish we can catch during the day and is a bonus. We're really anticipating that these bigger fish in particular open up when the sun gets to the trees. But yeah that's just a beautiful fish. There, look at that. That fills up the hole. And I tell you what, that's pretty common, you know, it seems like on a lot of lakes, you know, you can be catching four to six, seven inch fish. And then that bewitching hour where you get that sun sets on the trees and those big fish roll through. A few more maggots on here. I'm just loading up with five, six maggots. So one of the beauties of South Central Minnesota are some of the uh, prairie lakes that we have down here and in particular some uh, that are part of river connected waters. One of my favorite places to fish is along the Cannon Chain. Uh, we've got some really great panfish waters uh, with opportunities for a lot of different species. Uh, and, and river connections really, that's, that's a big part of, of growing some of those big fish too. You've got a continuous system, uh, bringing in new fish, bringing in food, bringing in nutrients. So uh, that's, a, that's a pattern that you see north to south and across the Midwest. When you have river connected lakes, you tend to have really productive fisheries. There, oh yeah. 
Oh, this fish is digging. Look at that. Look at that. Boy, if this is a bluegill, this is a great one. Look at that. Look at that. Oh my, it is a bluegill. Just a scrapper. That fish fought so hard. That's fun. Look at that. Six inch hole. That fish is probably a good eight and a half inch fish. Just a great looking fish. There she goes. So you take a bluegill, you know, even the big bluegills and a lot of cases, you know, they're bug eaters. You know, they're eating, they're eating insect larvae. They're eating zooplankton, you know, really small stuff. And in a lot of lakes, you know, you have two basic patterns that are going to serve you well through much of the winter. You know, you've got your weed patterns, you've got your weed edges, your weed lines, and then you've got your soft basin patterns where you have these fish roaming over that soft basin, which is usually a sticky type of mud where you have a lot of insect larvae. So these fish can be roaming anywhere in these basins, but when they get to the edges of the basins, I think those travel routes are more defined. And these fish, you know, they love that soft bottom, you know, and so even though it's just this big flat, big bowl, big basin out in the middle of this lake, you know, these fish will be up on that shoulder, up on that edge, and a lot of times just a matter of running that edge, these fish are just moving. And I tell you what, on so many different lakes that we've seen, you know, across the country, I tell you what, there's a prime time for targeting some of the big bluegills especially, you cannot go wrong with sunset on so many different bodies of water. Jason Mitchell Outdoors is brought to you by these industry leaders. <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah, what's my favorite series of hubs? The Clam C Series shelters work best for us. What's our favorite ice hub shelter? The X-Series from Clam Outdoors. Yeah. Choose the hub shelter that's right for you at Clam Outdoors. Pursue the ice. If these walls could talk, oh, you'd hear stories. And all of them get better every time they're told. Because you've got 40-inch gators out there. Giant Lakers. Crappie. Sunnies and walleye. So many walleye. <laughs> it's time to walk on water. Shields. Attention, ice anglers. If you or a loved one have suffered from catching complications, looming boredom, or overwhelming humiliation among your peers, call the Vexlar Group today. If you fish blind like a frozen zombie, you may be eligible to catch fish this year. If you've ever found yourself saying, you know, it's just nice to be out. You may be a struggling angler, and we know you're hurting. Please help stop this angling epidemic today by visiting www.vexlar.com. My name is Sam Sobey, and I approve this message. Introducing the Rise Float Suit with Motion Float Technology. Breathable, waterproof, secure, and all the features that make the difference. Waterproof cell phone pocket, rapid drain system, and maximum flexibility. Fish with security in the Rise Float Suit from Ice Armor by Clam. Rise above. Clam Outdoors. Pursue the ice. So the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources is really taking a close look at sunfish regulations in Minnesota. And this has been something that's building for some time. Uh, looking back in the past, uh, we actually had more conservative regulations on bluegills and sunfish. We used to have a 15 fish bag limit in the 1920s and even slightly larger bag limit in the 1930s. You think about that time frame, that's when folks really had a claim uh, to wanting to keep fish during the Depression era. Uh, today, you know, it's more of a recreational opportunity. Uh, but over time, surveys have shown and uh, our, our large scale uh, net catch records have shown these declines in the average size of bluegills. Seeing that decline in the average size of bluegills, I mean, you'll, you'll notice that your catch numbers go up. So you see lots of fish in the survey, but your average size drops. Large bluegills are important. Uh, they serve a really important, uh, you know, purpose to the lake 
uh, genetically, they, they're, they're important as parental males, what we call parental males. Uh, they are guarding those eggs. They are protecting it from raiders that are going to come in and, and eat, uh, eat young fish, whether it's other fish, um, other critters, insects, whatever it might be. Uh, that protection is important, and they are protecting from other cuckolder males that are trying to sneak in and spawn over those deposited eggs. And what'll happen, and this has been found and published on many years ago, is those sneakers, young males that come in that are undersized, they'll spawn, they'll pass on those genetics. And we'll actually, that next generation will come up to be sneakers as well. So you start to see those fish get smaller, those large bull parental males with the big black ear tabs and the brightly colored uh, breasts. Those are the fish that are protecting their nest. They're delaying sexual maturity to larger sizes. And that's a great thing to see. That means they're putting all that energy into growth. They're not putting it into reproduction. So we wanna protect those big male bluegills, those parental males. Oh yes. That is a good one. That is a good one. Oh yeah, there's a there's a nice, nice, nice crappie. Look at that. Get my hand in her. Oh come on. Open up. <laughs> that is a crappie. Pop that little half ant out of there. Look at that. That is my goodness, that's a beautiful fish. Look at that, whoa, <laughs> that fills up the hole. Tell you what, some of the, some of the new panfish management strategies going on over here in Minnesota are kind of intriguing to me because it's kind of the best of both worlds in the sense that I love eating fish. And so I like having places to go where I can catch say a bunch of six to eight inch bluegills for the table. But I tell you what, I love going out and catching some big fish. I think that's cool. I love catching big panfish, especially through the ice. You know, a lot of times a presentation for bluegills is pretty delicate. It's all about finesse a lot. I mean, you see here, you know, I'm not marking fish right now. See, I'm just really pounding and quivering that rod. I'm being pretty aggressive with it when I'm not seeing fish because I'm still trying to pull them in. And a lot of times once a fish shows up, it's just delicate, where a lot of times you're just barely quivering that rod, barely quivering that spring bobber. That spring bobber is just causing that jig to dance. And sometimes it's even just a matter of just holding it still. And if that spring bobber moves, does anything, set the hook. So we're just using a two or three pound frost monofilament. Spool of reel take out a lot of the line twist and spin on the lure. This is a 27 inch medium light clam straight drop with the spring bobber. And that's just a really, a, really a great, bluegill setup. Ooh, good crappie. It's frisky. There we go. So probably just a little under 12 inches, but foot long crappie are not quite. Most people won't, won't, uh, won't flick their nose for that. Let's see, there's usually some gills that are mixed in, so hopefully get something cooking here. I think the messaging that, that our agency, that the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources is trying to do with this Quality Sunfish Initiative is to give opportunities to everyone. We are, we are telling folks that, yeah, you should still go out, you should have that fish fry, enjoy that with the family. It's, it's gonna be the, the fish for everyone. You know, it is the most popular uh, fish in the state, but at the same time, we can put some of these regulations in place in certain situations where you'll still be able to have those big bluegills. Look at that. You definitely need to pull your transducer out because these babies will wrap you up. Just swimming in a big circle. Oh, look at that. Don't you love that when a bluegill can give you that much? Look at that. Gorgeous fish. See, that's a female there. 
That's a respectable fish. See, the females, they don't have quite the height that some of those big bulls or those males do, but. You know, so you look at just selective harvest, you know, in the beauty of selective harvest is it's not saying you can't keep fish or you shouldn't keep fish because I tell you what, keeping fish is a, is a really important, good component of fishing. You know, I mean, there's nothing better as a family or a group of friends going out and catching some fish and then eating those fish and enjoying those fish together. It's, it's just a good way to live. But at the same time, you look at what selective harvest has done to enhance many fisheries. You look at what selective harvest has done for walleye populations and, and basically all fish populations. It doesn't matter if it's bass, uh, the catch release ethic that's uh, preserved and enhanced some musky fisheries. You look at the quality of fishing and it seems like wherever you have great fishing, you either have no people or you have a strong catch release ethic where people are selectively harvest that usually that smaller to medium sized fish and letting those bigger fish go, letting the biggest fish go and letting the smallest fish go. It seems like that coincides with great fishing in today's world where you know all these lakes are accessible by what constitutes a lot of good anglers. There we go. What do we got here? Oh, look at that. I should have pulled my transducer out. Look at that. Oh, oh, look how thick that fish is. Look at that. You just see the girth and see how big those ears are? That's a special fish. That is a special fish. But let her go, let her grow. Here she goes. You can see behind me here, the sun's getting low on these trees. It is witching hour. I got another fish down here. Once the light starts to go down, you see that big rise. Insects coming off the bottom, zooplankton clouds, and that is feeding time for those big bluegills. They'll even linger into darkness. So a lot of times you see that clutter on your flasher. Uh, that is the insect activity, the zooplankton activity firing up. And when that happens, it's go time. Oh, that little move paid off. That is a big old beautiful crappie. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Look how thick that fish is. Big old mouth. That is big enough, huh? Look at that. That is just gorgeous. Boy, look at that build on these fish. Very fertile fisheries down in this part of the world. show you what we're doing here. We're using a small vertical jig and it's early January. You start getting into midwinter. In my opinion, when these fish get a little bit tougher, you need to use a little bit more finesse. These vertical jigs can really be the ticket versus the horizontal jig. Reason being is getting midwinter. A lot of times these fish just demand more finesse. So you take a vertical teardrop style jig like the clam pro tackle half end that I'm holding here. When, it, when the fish are looking up at it, bluegills and crappies are looking up at the bait that vertical jig just puts off a lot smaller profile, a lot smaller footprint. It moves less water. There's less water displacement versus a big horizontal jig. And so when you really need to call fish in, when you have aggressive fish, I like to use the horizontal jigs, but when you need a little bit more subtleness, a little bit more finesse, that half ant is just deadly. Be the right flavor. Oh yeah. Oh, thought I lost him. <laughs> oh yeah. Look at that ear tab. I mean, if that doesn't get you excited about bluegill fishing when your thumbnail is as big as his ear tab, that is a big bull bluegill. Big orange breast, big ear tab. Kind of a 
characteristic of those big males and that's what we're looking for that's what we're here today long pectoral fin look how long that thing sticks back and this best of all check out the forehead or as some of my bluegill fishing buddies call it the five head it's folded over the top of his snout what a great fish i'm gonna do a quick measure and look at that we square the tail off he's two ten he's about a nine and three quarter inch bluegill Whew. that man that is a fish well let's put him back and pass it on to the next generation and there he goes waving goodbye oh those are the ones that we come here for unbelievable I think the one of the keys today is has been uh, certainly patience uh, you can get into a steering contest with these fish uh, but you know really finding out what they want holding it steady or pounding it hard and I'm finding pounding it hard has been the key tonight and as our sun is starting to slip away Look at that one. This is a good one. Look at that. Bluegill that takes out drag. Come on up here. Fish just a muscle. Oh, look at this. This is just beautiful. Look at that. That fills up a hole. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. That is just gorgeous. Gorgeous. Now breaking down what these regulations might be, really it, what's been a pleasant revelation for us is as we have surveyed uh, folks for their opinions on these reduced bags, we've run about 85% of folks that are in support. So we're seeing this ship. That's, that's, a, that's a really important uh, a step education is such a critical component to, to what we're seeing here and what the average angler understands about the importance of these big fish. They're recognizing that we've lost these opportunities and that, hey, if we have the right conditions, let's support it. And just seeing that social shift over the last 20 years has really been eye-opening for us, gives us a lot of hope. Um, I, I think the analogy really does fit. You know, it takes probably 10 to 12 years to get these bluegills in a lot of lakes, even north to south with our differences in growth, up to that 10 inch mark and close to that one pound mark. Uh, so we need to give them some time. We need, to, we need to protect them. We need to show how valuable they are. And there's a biological component to that. What's fascinating to me is that more and more anglers are starting to appreciate big panfish. A 10 and a half inch bluegill, it takes just as many years to create that fish as that 30 inch walleye behind me. And so the selective harvest mentality that's starting to really creep into ice fishing and pan fishing, I think is good for the sport. But these regulations that Minnesota's proposing or that Minnesota's implemented on some select lake, it's gonna be interesting to see where this goes. I think it's important that people still have places to go where they can just catch fish for their freezer or for their fridge. That's a still an important, good, healthy, wholesome component of fishing. But it's also nice where you can find places with those big pie plates, those big pan fish. And it's becoming more and more obvious if we don't protect that resource, you know, those fish, the size is just gonna get smaller and smaller until pretty soon you have such stunted bluegills that nobody's gonna wanna target them. But it'd be interesting to know how this takes effect and how it affects other states when it comes to managing panfish. And obviously there are some lakes that, you know, you're probably better off taking more panfish up. So this isn't a one size fits all. This isn't a regulation that goes across the board, but I'd love to know what you think. What's your opinion? Do you think your states are doing a good job of managing panfish? Do you think some of the regulations that are happening in Minnesota are gonna be good for the resource or good for the long-term health of the fishery? So leave your comments below. I'd love to hear what everybody's opinions are on this matter. <laughs>